Hi, everyone. You are now tuning in to Conversations with Filmmakers podcast. We present our final discussion with our special guest, New York-based journalist, author, and filmmaker, Alberto Ferreras. We hope you enjoy part two of our discussion. Thank you for joining us today. You are an author. So can you tell us more about your novel, um, Be Is in Beauty? I did see the press release and everything like that on it potentially being um, the adaptation as well that people might not know about. So, well, okay, so- Go so maybe, for it, my guy, the stage. <laughs> this is your stage. <laughs> In the summer, I sit on the other side of the room and then I have the books behind me and I'm like, oh, you're my novel. Uh, <laughs> but uh, BS and Beauty, um, I, 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 uh, I wrote it originally as a screenplay. Ooh. And uh, I, through a dear friend of mine, I learned that at the time Warner Books was looking for novels about Latino women. And my protagonist was an overweight Latina. Mm -hmm. And um, and I I sent I wrote the first couple of chapters as a novel, sent them to the editor, and they liked it so much they said, Yeah, but you know, where where where's the story going? So I sent them the screenplay. And just based on that, they acquired the book. Wow. So I got very lucky that I was able to find a publisher before the novel was written. <clears throat> and uh, I I spent, uh, this is back in 2006, um, I spent three months like locked up, finishing the novel. And and um, and then it took uh, at least three years to, to make it. Wow. Because there's a lot of things, you know, people... I, and I swear to God, sometimes uh, there's so much, there's so many stories about Hollywood in Hollywood. Mm -hmm. And the, 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 there's this kind of like fantasy that, oh, you know, I found an agent, that's it. Now I'm going to be just like blah, blah, blah. Oh, I, you know, I'm making a movie, that's it. Oh, I'm going to Saunders, that's it. That's it, no. It's <laughs> always bad. back to square one. Mm -hmm. And um, so... They, but thank God, the uh, was published after three years, came out in 2009, and mm -hmm. there was some interest, but nothing gelled, uh, honestly. Um, and I think that at the time, to give you an idea, my protagonist is an overweight Cuban-American girl. Mm -hmm. And at the time, you couldn't find images of overweight beautiful girls on getty um well i'm gonna i don't want to say the name but in stock music uh, stock uh, picture libraries yeah i literally was we were looking for a cover for for the novel and uh and i you know i wanted to you know to give them examples and when you look for um you know fat and beautiful uh mm -hmm. stock uh picture collections didn't have anything it has changed. Thank God for the Lizzo's of the world. I think oh, as, there's a lot more um, focus on, you know, plus size. And I, and, but that just shows how much you think outside of the box is that I, so many years ago. Things that have changed in, in a relatively short period of time. Yeah, um, but you, you were also very innovative to make your main character that because they have created TV shows recently but they're not of minority by minority people or telling their story you know so yeah. it's it's crazy that way back then it's not way back then to to me it's still 1998 forever you know <laughs> i don't know Why not? Yeah. yeah but no but it you know th th I'm, I'm happy things have changed so at the at the time it didn't turn into uh a show but recently um uh, NBC Telemundo fa uh, found the book and they they wanted to turn it into a a series. Let's see, a lot of planets have to align, mm -hmm. and, they, and they may, but they did make an announcement a few months ago. And for anyone who wants to read the novel, it is very funny, uh, and it's uh, I, I think it's online. I I think it's out of print, but you can find it. A, a, a lot of public libraries bought it and and you can find it on ebay and uh it's very some people read the entire book which is 300 pages in one night wow that's a good sign you know that is a great sign that means the story is very engaging so i'm excited and we're not going to wish for anything this series will be coming out 
NBC right. do oh, not, you know, look, the Telemundo, whatever, do not drop the ball on this. Yeah. We need to make this happen for Alberto because he's a very hardworking man and he's so far into his career of commitment to this industry. So I love that. Now, let me ask you, are there any projects out there right now that you'd have loved to work on? You know, like things that you're you're streaming now or watching. That 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 I that I wish I was as working in. Yeah, that you were a part no, of. It. I I don't know if working in because I become. This is stuff that happens when you get older. Let me tell you. <laughs> um, I am more of a um. I, I you know I don't follow artists anymore. I feel I feel like when you've lived long enough and you're honest with yourself, you're like. Madonna, I love that song. I didn't love that album. You know? <laughs> <clears throat> you stop kind of like worshiping mm -hmm. people. You 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 see somebody did this amazing book. The next book wasn't that good. Mm -hmm. Or some some people are incredible and they everything they do is wonderful. So um, not very often I find things that I like. It's terrible. Mm -hmm. I become like a big pain in the butt. Uh, I can tell you that there's a show called How To with John Wilson on mm -hmm. on Max as well that I think is amazing. It's, for some people, it's going to be weird. It's going to be obscure. I think it's poetry. It's video poetry, if that is possible. Um, I love that word, video poetry. Video poetry. Absolutely. I think that damn show, I wish I had thought about it before he did it, but it's so perfect the way he does it that all I can wish is that he continues doing it and doing it so well, because mm -hmm. it's just a very um, strange and whimsical and very New York. Anyone who lives in New York is, he had an episode that was all about the, the wonderful and terrible things that can happen to you when you find a parking spot in New York City. When I tell you that is genius for the people that have lived in New York or these congested cities that is golden so many scenarios the yeah. other day i was watching on instagram a guy it's oh my god it's something called um this is funny they call it your new york city like you know like people be like you're either like yelling at each other and it's your nyc and it's a video of these two people driving down the street cursing each other out and they're like that is an actual New York greeting, like it's actual our love language. It's just to be like, move your ass out the way, blah blah yeah. blah. <laughs> well, when when you have a car, which I've never had and I never would in, in New oh, York City, come on. the hardest thing. No, I swear to God, I'm like, wow, having to get up like at five in the morning to move the car. Wow, that I don't it's, enjoy. It's a nightmare. Um, well, he talks about that that phenomenon. He goes deep into that, into what it's like to find a parking spot in front of your house, but then it's such a great parking spot that you don't want to use your car because you don't want to lose that parking spot so it's like i you know it's horrible uh, but it's beautiful but it's horrible <laughs> I, love I would love that so but he's a great guy you know my favorite latino show and maybe some people don't see it that way i think is the most intelligent brilliant it's on hulu it's called uh, what we do in the shadows and it's oh. a vampire show that happens to have one Latino character who little by little becomes the star of the show, uh, Harvey Guillen. Oh mm -hmm. my God. It's because, you know, I had a drama teacher who used to say that a good play is not just about one thing. It's about a lot of things. Mm -hmm. And and this show is, is not about vampires. It's about a lot of things. It's about the things that we aspire to do, the people that we worship and how somewhere along the way we realize that you know we're as good as they are it probably even better and more powerful so, so what they um, do in the shadows on hulu what we do it's that. about three vampires uh in staten island who have what they call a familiar which is this kind of like human slave that you know he's in charge of finding victims and, and mm -hmm. you know, digging the bodies in the yard and um and that's that's the Latino character, you know, like you know, their slave is is Salvadoran. Yeah, <laughs> it, it's but you know great. that's amazing.
And now a word from one of our sponsors. After starting my podcast, I needed to hire the pros to market the content. Are you looking for digital success? Look no further. World Boss HQ is your strategic partner. Their experts turn your vision into a digital masterpiece. From stunning websites to powerful marketing, they've got you covered. Startups or established businesses, they are your one-stop solution. Visit worldbosshq.com. That is W-O-R-L-D-B-O-S-S-H-Q.com and unleash your potential today. World Boss HQ Digital Marketing, your online empire awaits. We are excited to bring you this world exclusive teaser from Bad Rabbit Pictures and Movie Pods. They are presenting Age of Prophecy, a sci-fi fantasy podcast done in the style of the radio dramas of yesteryear. Coming soon to all streaming platforms. Visit www.moviepods.com or www.thenukechronicles.com for all the release dates. You won't want to miss this one. Your miss was born from our history. Let's check it out. Life, a vile, messy sequence of events before we die. All designed for something beyond us. It has to be, or else what's the point? You don't know me, but I know you. I am responsible for your triumphs and miseries. Zira and Lilzor, and to truly understand your own story, you must know mine. Your myths were born from my history. Hi there, and welcome back to Conversations with Filmmakers podcast. Like you mentioned before, you know, you didn't see when you first came here, you you weren't sure how many Latino people were here, right? And I think that's something that people can relate to for this industry as well, right? Because you don't see a lot of Latino people, unfortunately, that have, you know, made it to the upper echelon of, you know, in Hollywood and everything. It's a very small group, just similar to like the actors. It's probably what they say, the two to 3%. So to see more of that and highlighting those experiences has been really excellent. But I wanted to ask you, you know, um, really quickly, when do you feel that pivotal moment happened for you that you transitioned from aspiring to professional? Um, uh. Or do you consider yourself a professional? You know, yeah, I, I personally do. I think you're very excellent based on, you know, our past conversations, you know? So, yeah. Do you um, know? I, I think um, I, I can tell you a story that is really funny. I, I love think the, the story. <laughs> um, but I have, again, because I, I have different gifts. Thank you, thank you Jesus. Knock on wood, knock on wood, knock on wood. Glory. Uh, but I, you know, I can write, I can direct, I can edit, I can produce, which is very difficult to direct and produce. So I avoid it at any cost. <laughs> Two different sides of your brain that don't really communicate. And when you have to do both things, it can be very difficult. Uh, so if you're one of those people who can do the both, but you can't do it at the same time, um, don't feel bad about it. It's normal. So anyway, um, so I I was hired to do a commercial um, for for a pharmacy chain in in Florida, and I was working. I don't know if in in the film industry sometimes you have these crews that are amazing, especially when you work in commercials, because these guys they work together in all in every single project. 
and they're very well connected and and they move super fast they know each other and they they go from project to project but everybody from like the the av to the catering person they're yeah. like hey joe hey bobby hi jenny hey francisco you know they they know each other so the only person who's an outsider in that team is the director and so we had to shoot overnight and we had to shoot with uh four pharmacists and some of them didn't speak spanish that well but mm -hmm. one of my specialties is to work with people who who mix both languages and 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 and, and treat them really really well so they deliver the lines that i need mm -hmm. so that night we were supposed to do first all the talent lines and then all the all the images all the b-roll that came with it and because it took so long to get these people to say the things properly for a commercial we were a little late oh wow. and uh and i'm gonna say a little late that for them it was a big deal right <laughs> and uh because we were shooting overnight we had um <laughs> we had lunch at three in the morning that was lunch <laughs> and they had little tables outside and you know my producer was all like huffing and puffing and she was like, Alberto, we're really behind. So we are not going to be able to do this. And we're not going to, and she was like, you know, crossing I things. Out all this stuff and, like... and I'm like, you know, that is not so, the hard part is is in the can. We have the the, the talent line. So this, this is going to be, I don't know, because you, you know, it's taking you too long. And I'm like, we're going to be okay. All right. Let me have lunch. <laughs> so I took my tray and, you know, there were different little tables with, with the crew eating. Mm -hmm. and, I take, and I sit down with some of the people and I see that they get up and they move on to another table. Oh, no. And I'm like, is this like an accident? <laughs> so <laughs> I take my tray and I'm like, nah, nah these motherfuckers are not going to do this shit to me. So I take my tray and I sit in another table. And I see them getting up and moving to another table. And I said, these are, I didn't say it, <laughs> are talking shit about me <laughs> during the lunch break. I mean, the, so I go back to the producer and I said, we are going to shoot absolutely everything that it is on that storyboard. Okay. Everything. Okay. No, are you sure? Yes, I am sure. So after that, I became like freaking military. <laughs> I, I did go military on their ass and I had them running back and forth. And we shot absolutely every single thing that we needed um, until, um, you know, the morning. We, we wrapped at eight in the morning because they had to open the store for the, for the, for the public. So we were done. And everybody was like, oh my God, you're amazing. You're great. Well, I'm like, Oh, now I'm amazing, you son of a... So I think that was a moment, maybe because mm -hmm. I was questioned, you know, at that very primal level, um, that I was like, you know, so I'm a professional, I'm going to show it to you. So, um, <laughs> so yeah, that, that was a tough one. And I have learned later on, uh, a dear friend of mine included me in these uh, this, um, conversations with filmmakers that actually Disney was was sponsoring, bringing in uh, diversity mm -hmm. uh, filmmakers. And they would say that the most important quality of a, of a director that they would work with is if they could command the trust of the crew. Yes. So at, when you are bilingual, and in my case, um, of course, I know what I want, but my glossary of film terms started in Spanish. So mm -hmm. every time I have to tell you, you know, not things that are as basic as a close-up or a medium <laughs> shot, but but there are very specific words that are there, there's a there's a glossary that that group may use that I might not fami be familiar with, like mm -hmm. a camera move. If they call it, we're we're gonna do a track up or whatever, they may have a word for it that I'm not familiar with. That doesn't mean that I don't know what I'm doing. It only means that that's not my word. And also, when English is your second language and you get nervous, then you run out of words. And that's when you start moving your hands and you're like, I know what I'm talking about, even if I cannot express myself. 
properly. <laughs> okay. So you know that that, you are that funny. You are super. I mean, I think it just goes back to you moving into your leadership portion and just saying, listen, the gloves are off. You're not gonna disrespect me, and this is my set. Period. Now, an exciting message from our sponsors. When I decided to launch this podcast, I had the tools to find talent and market the show, but needed a skilled editor to bring it all to life. That's when I turned to Jacob Daly at redhawk.uk. His collaborative approach and swift revisions transformed my vision into reality. Redhawk.uk, your one-stop solution for creative content services. Reach out to them. Now a word from another of our supporting sponsors, that is Realm IQ, a new AI consultancy started by film marketing veteran, Kurt Doty, who has built an international team of AI mentors to help AI change management for your business. Go to www.curtdoty.co slash Realm IQ, smart people for smart adoption, creating smart worlds. Realm IQ, book your AI workshop today, adopt or perish. Hi there, and welcome back to Conversations with Filmmakers podcast. But you know, when you're riding that wave, you have to be firm, but you also have to be kind. I mean, I'm sure they've had a trillion experiences when they're like, I, I, nightmare. I mean, directors who didn't know what they were doing or they were responsible. I I worked on on film sets doing behind the scenes where you, you see that the crew is not happy with the director and they're in every chance they have, they're making fun of him or her. I mean, which is mm -hmm. heartbreaking. Uh, but at the same time, maybe, you know, that the person that was assigned for that job didn't know what they were doing. Who knows? Um, well, I mean, it, it kind of mirrors what corporate does, right? Uh, every single time you're always like, how did the hell did this person get promoted? They know nothing. All they do is sit around and delegate everything and they have no clue what your job is. So it sounds like on a film set as well, when you felt like you became a professional, I think that is so inspiring as well because you didn't give up and that's a big thing. So if there is a Latino aspiring filmmaker listening, what advice would you give them, you know, to get started in this industry, to maneuver their way through this industry? What, what do you feel could be something pivotal as a learning experience for them? Well, I, there's, I, I, I always say this, uh, I don't know if it's that smart, but that's, this is what I say. I say that um, you can, uh, work for the lottery or you can play the lottery. Mm. So if you work for the lottery, you're going to be assigned, you're going to get a monthly check, but you're going to be in charge of this. You're not going to be the person who makes the movies, who writes the scripts, who, who, you know, who's necessarily directing them. You're going to be an AD or you're going to be a DP or you're going to be a sound engineer. There's a lot of jobs in the industry if you want to work for the lottery mm -hmm. because that's your passion and that's fantastic. If somebody says, you know something, I love sound and, and I'm good at it. And this is how I'm going to make a living. Yay. Yeah, one less problem to worry about. <laughs> make sure that you get your jobs, that people, that, that you build trust in the industry. So they keep calling you. Uh, yeah. If you want to make your movies, then you want to play the lottery. Mm -hmm. You don't want to work for the lottery. And this is a harder um, path. It's, it's definitely more difficult <clears throat> because you are going to need to support yourself probably working here and there. And, you know, when you're in the movie set because you're the sound engineer of this movie, then you're going to like inch your way to the producer. I'm going to say, I have a great idea for a film. And you're going to see that producer running away from you. Because the whole table watching. getting up, the entire table getting up. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. No, because it it's Not you know it, it it's very difficult. Um, first of all, if you're working a project, you don't want to hear somebody telling you I have an idea for a movie. It's like you know something. Keep your idea. Put it on paper. Register the your idea. Send it through a lawyer. Blah 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 blah. First yeah. of all, because of liabilities, but also because um, 
you know, everybody has great ideas. Everybody says, oh, oh my God, you should make a reality show about my life because it's so much fun. Alberto, I swear I thought that was only, not that it was only me, but you know, as a screenwriter, and that is the first thing people approach you. Oh my God, you write? Well, you should do my life story. And I'm like, is your life story worth an hour and a half or two hours? Where would we start? What time in your life will we begin? You know, it's just like, it's a it's, lot of work. You're telling me- A lot of work and it's really delicate. And yeah. and, and I, I don't think that people understand uh, I recently, so, uh, a friend of a friend called me and he's like, well, I have this great book and this great idea and uh, you just have to put me in front of the person who's going to buy it. I'm like, what? You just have to put me in front of the person who's going to buy it? That is the hardest thing in this business to actually have access to someone who's going to, you know, buy your book and turn it into something. Absolutely. It is the most difficult. Years ago, um, when Martin Scorsese won the Oscar for the, the animated film Hugo, the first person he thanked was his granddaughter because wow. she, she handed him the book and said, Grandpa, you should make a movie out of this. And I saw that and I said, where the hell is that little girl? I have to give her my novel. Where, how old is she? <laughs> uh, Can I just girl. drop it at the playground and nobody think I'm perverted for being at the playground? I drop his books it. in front of her. <laughs> Mark him in the head with it. Oops, sorry. I, that came from, oh, oh, oh this book girl, just fell in you. It must be an accident. Um, um, it I don't know. It, it, so ev everything, it is complicated and it's a lot like playing the lottery. So if you have a great story, if you are a filmmaker, if you're an aspiring filmmaker, tell the story that you have. Find a ways, shoot it with an iPhone. Uh, do you know, if you go to film school, become friends with the people that are going to school with you so you can, uh, you have support because the, the, the hardest thing is to work with, um, is, is to create that level of trust with people who can help you and, and do it professionally. Mm -hmm. um, when I, if for anyone who wants to see some of my work um, on YouTube, there's a bunch of short films called The Lessons. Yeah. Uh, I did eight of them. And those shorts were done after one rehearsal and shot in four hours. And I did it specifically that way. So to force myself to do it, mm -hmm. to not enter a, a holding pattern of like, oh, I have this idea. I want to show to so-and-so to see if he thinks it's good in order to, I'm like, no, I think this is funny. I think this is good. I know actors. I, I work with an amazing cinematographer, uh, Alex Tikic who is, he could do sound, he could do video. We would literally, it would be four of us in the set, but the, the set was my apartment because we showed everything inside my tiny studio. And, <laughs> um, but but it was just this, this basically it's me saying, I'm going to make this yes or yes. I mean, there's no, nothing's going to get in the way. Uh, I found good actors because they liked the script. That was, that was a sign. I, I edited everything myself. You don't know how to do it. You learn how to do it. Yeah. You you find yourself incapable of learning how to do it. You become friends with someone who knows how to do it. But but it's up to you. It's just very difficult when when the entire media industry is telling you, oh, you just have to want it. No, you have to want it. I have to do it, and you have to find the resources, and and um, maybe some people. They, they hand it to them. I, I, I can't say that. I, some people, some things were handed to me. I'm not gonna lie, and I'm, I'm glad, but no, 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 nothing right away. Nothing right away. You <laughs> it, put the time. It wasn't like, hey, <laughs> you want? No, no, it was like you know, work, 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 work. Oh, here, you know. Yeah. We're gonna, exactly. Okay. Give, give one more give opportunity that requires more work. Yeah, exactly. Just, give him a bone. Give him so, a glass of milk. He'll I be, think people should believe in their ideas and do them uh, and, and not wait to be discovered. Don't, don't, that's my biggest advice. Don't wait to be discovered. You discover yourself, you do it. Exactly, almost like the lottery. The lottery winner is not gonna, somebody's not gonna knock on your door and give you the winning ticket, right? So yeah. the moral of the story I'm taking from it is be passionate, create your network as well. 
right? So you mentioned that with like, I had a cinematographer, I have an edit, you know, I went, learned an editing. If I didn't know it, I went and found it really in this community. And that's been a really great theme I've learned about doing this podcast, Alberto, is that a lot of times that community just keeps growing and being built out. And like the same people that you could have done a project with 20, 25 years ago is someone you can tap into today, you know? And like, that's still going to support your dream of filmmaking. So with that being said, can you please let our audience know how to get in contact with you, such as your website and also what you're working on now? <clears throat> so um, if, if you want to like look me up, I think I'm, I'm kind of addicted to um, Instagram and Facebook a little also. So I'm on Facebook, on Instagram, Alberto Ferreras underscore nyc that's how you find me um and what i'm working on i have um right right now i've been working for the last uh year and a half for univision for a branded content studio called asi which i think is we're doing beautiful work and i'm very grateful that they they believe in me they brought me in as a consultant and i'm still there so that that's good news and and I'm working on an uh, I'm working uh, we're gonna try to bring back Hamlet in Harlem mm -hmm. next year in February I believe we're gonna do another show for theater for the new city it's gonna be in February stay tuned I'm not sure if I we have a title yet but it's gonna be an off off Broadway immersive experience oh what does that mean I don't know. You know? I don't know, but listen, it might win a Peabody. <laughs> I don't know, probably not. But no. you know, I I think it's gonna be fun and it's gonna be different. I mean, I I think that theater should do what movies cannot do. Mm -hmm. That's what I think. And the movies cannot change every night, and the movies cannot reach out to you, and the movies cannot look at you in the eye. You think they're looking at you in the eye? They're not. So these are things that I like about theater, and I like about immersive and interactive theater. Uh, so those are two things that are that are coming up. I'm working on uh, another project that I cannot say anything about that has to do with with Latino history in the U.S. I love that. And if anybody goes to Washington D.C., please go to the National Museum of American History. Find the Molina Gallery. is the first dedicated gallery of of Latino culture in the U.S. Uh, that is part of the Smithsonian system and and help and contribute and get involved in the creation of the uh, Museum of the American Latino, which doesn't exist as a building, but it already exists as an institution. That is amazing. And Alberto, I just want to thank you so much for joining us today because you, you've given so much insight, not only for the Latino experience, but filmmaking giving educational tips and all of that and just really telling us your journey. So it started from those shoes on the wall <laughs> that you'll be dancing in or you used to dance in um, all the way down to, you know, you just are really inspiring people today. So you've been amazing. And I just thank, thank you for, for, for giving me the chance to talk and thank you for what you do, Monty, because it, it rocks. Ah, I love that. Thank you so much. You've just tuned into an episode of Conversations with Filmmakers podcast. We'd like to thank our guests for joining us and sharing their knowledge. This has been a production of Vonti Pictures, hosted by me, Vonti McRae, a screenwriter and producer. We'd also like to thank Bad Rabbit Pictures for the animated content and creator of upcoming podcast, Age of Prophecy along with our sponsor, RedHawk.UK, with all episodes being edited by Jacob Daly, director, producer, and a man of many talents. Come back next week as this saga continues for the Conversations with Filmmakers podcast.